this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing Week 11 in the NFL by talking to Nate Tice of The Athletic and the Silent Count Substack, getting his thoughts on not just Week 11, but also a deeper dive into the role film can play in betting and how to bridge the gap between, you know, identifying what film may identify that we may miss by the numbers and a whole lot more. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, after last week, I feel like I might need some film analysis. I might need some like voodoo work done. Uh, it was not great for me. So I am ready for week 11 to be here. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Also did not have the greatest uh, week with my bets. I feel like I kind of picked some of the pick some of the wrong games, even though my numbers were on a lot. I I, I kind of had a feeling my numbers were going to be fine just with so many double digit spreads. Right. And teams that I didn't feel like deserved necessarily those double digit spreads. So yeah, that's how it goes. I think that I need to take the the Greg Peterson approach. We had Greg on the show before where he bets every game. Because, like, if I had done that, I'd have been fine last week. Like, uh, you know, my numbers right. were okay. If I had taken the Greg Peterson approach of bet every game, I'd have been fine. But the ones I chose to bet were not that great. Um, so looking for a rebound here in week number 11. We'll go back through week 10 in just a second. But first, a, uh, we're going to have Nate Tice on today. You can find Nate on Twitter at Nate underscore Tice. If you don't know Nate, uh, he is son of Mike Tice, former Vikings head coach back in my days back in Minnesota when I was a youth wearing a Dante Culpepper jersey out on the practice fields for middle school football. Uh, he worked in the NFL for the Falcons, was a coach with them. He played quarterback at Wisconsin and now works for The Athletic, does uh, our podcast, Robert Mays, does a lot of you know film-based stuff. Also has a, his own substack called The Silent Count. And Nate is unique because he understands analytics while being a film guy. And I think that... If we're going to talk to someone about, you know, the role film can play, I want to talk to someone who's not going to be like, you know, sometimes condescending about it. And Nate is not that. Nate is the opposite, where he understands it and will simplify things for people who may not totally do that. So I want to have Nate on today to talk about that, talk about the role film can play when trying to bet on games and much more. So Nate coming up in just one second. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, you name it, we are there. Hit subscribe and also leave us a rating and review if you like what you hear. Before we talk to Nate, though, got to go back to last week and eat some crow based on what happened there. Covering the past. All right, so in week 10, we had Brandon Gadula, my colleague over at Number Fire On, to preview week number 10. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula13. Check him out with me on the Daily Fantasy Podcast. We have the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. And like I said, it was pretty much a bloodbath across the board last week. Brandon and I both had thoughts on the Seattle Green Bay game. Uh, Brandon had Seattle plus three and a half and over 49 and a half. And I had the Seahawks team total over 23. Oh, boy. <laughs> was real bad. Brandon did get moving yeah. on the spread bet because it closed at three, uh, but Green Bay shut them out 17 nothing. And Ed, I feel like I just was too confident in a guy who was not sleeping, had a broken finger, probably a, a misstep in judgment there and being overly confident he, in a guy coming off a big impactful injury. He wasn't, he wasn't sleeping? He, he was rehabbing his finger for 19 hours a day. Yeah, but, but part of rehabbing your finger is to sleep and let your body recover. You would think, but if you have nano bubbles, you don't need sleep. That's the rule. So, all right. You know, um, the sleep thing actually didn't, it, like, I don't know. I think just in retrospect, I should have been more skeptical, given that he was ahead of timeline, stuff like that. He apparently couldn't take snaps under center in uh, this game. So, like, that limits things quite a bit. I think it was an error in judgment on my part with that one. I think you also had a game, and I think you're also having a stretch of games where the Green Bay Packers has been had defense has been really good, probably yeah. unsustainably good. Yeah. They were down their top corner, still played great coverage on DK and uh, Tyler Lockett. I don't think that happens every time these two teams get together. Right. So, uh, mea culpa on that one. Brandon was on the Browns at plus one and a half. Uh, it closed at two and a half, and the the Patriots just you know they roasted them. Uh, the Browns were up seven nothing. I didn't talk about this on the show, but I did bet plus two and a half. Uh, so at least I didn't talk about it on the show, uh, yeah. but it doesn't help my my pocketbook any. Patriots scored twice quick, uh, spiraled out of control from there. Uh, easy win for the Patriots. Brandon's on the Jets at plus 13. This number 
moved a lot during the week. It was 13 when we talked. It moved to 12, which was a good movement, and then back to 13 and a half by kickoff. And the Jets' defense actually played decent in the first half. They held the Bills to 10 points in the first 28 minutes, but then the Bills scored before half, lit them up in the third quarter, and like that's something that can happen with the Bills. Like They can go on those runs. That offense is capable of that. It's actually something we'll talk about with Nate, too, about how they're a volatile offense and what that means for them going forward. Brandon was on uh, the over for Atlanta versus Dallas, and one team held uh, their part of the bargain here. Uh, that was a 55 when we talked about it, and it closed. It just wasn't competitive, competitive enough. Uh, the Cowboys won 43-3, to but I think that that – I don't think that was a mistake, like, because – Part of the risk you run with betting high totals in non-competitive games is this. But the spread tightened uh, in favor of Atlanta. It, it opened at nine or nine and a half and closed at seven and a half. Mm-hmm. So I actually think that this one, the process here was good. It was just that Atlanta had like an implosion that like, I, I don't think this was a forecastably blowout type game. Do you agree with that? I mean, they had some issues with turnovers, right? Yeah. Too? Yeah. Yeah. So that one definitely happens for sure. Uh, Final one was a close one for Brandon. Uh, He had the over in Nashville for the Titans and Saints. Uh, It was 44 and a half. Fell to 43, potentially due to Alvin Kamara being ruled out, but it still almost got there. It probably should have. Um, The Saints scored to make it a 44-point game late. Again, the total is 44 and a half. They were going for two to try to tie the game. And if they had made it, the over would have hit. Had they made one of the two extra points they they missed earlier, it would have hit. So had either thing broken in his favor, he would have gotten that one. Just not quite. So uh, extra points, uh, tough luck there for Brandon. I lost my other bet as well. Uh, that was the Cardinals minus 10 and a half against the Panthers. This was wow. on Wednesday. We talked about it. Yeah. I thought Kyler Murray is going to play. Um, right. DeAndre Hopkins got ruled out. Kyler actually did practice Friday. So like, you know, I don't know. Uh, it was before the like, Panthers signed Cam Newton. I'm not sure if that impacted anything outside of like morale, I guess. But uh, when you put... That combined with Kyler being rolled out, it closed at seven. So Panthers rolled here. They're up 23 nothing at one point. I was um, out in this part of the afternoon, looked at my phone for a touchdown notification, saw two Cam Newton touchdowns. I was like, uh oh, <laughs> something <laughs> has gone seriously wrong here. And they won 34 to 10. But like recording Wednesday, I-, I felt pretty safe assuming that Kyler would go because yeah. he was apparently a game time call the week before. Just didn't happen. Right. And you, you, I still think you want to bet it then because I agree. you can't, you can't wait for these injury news. No. You have to, uh, the market's going to move on you. So I had it at 14. So if Kyler's ruled in, it's probably going to move to 14. I don't want to lose three and a half points. I don't know if it's you. moving to 14, but right. But it's probably but moving yeah. at least. And I think that I, I feel good about when I place that bet still. I, I know that didn't work, but like, and that could sound like bullheaded, but like, I still think that was the right way to go. Uh, you had Denver minus two and a half against Philadelphia. Close at a pick. Uh, Philly Yikes. won this one 30 to 13. The movement was weird because I didn't really see a whole lot in Philly here. Didn't seem like the type of situation yeah. where they'd be able to run the football as well as they did. I don't know. It was just a, a weird game well, there as well. I mean, they, they they can run the football. Yeah. I mean, that's that's probably the strength of that team. I was more thinking um, about like the Denver defense. I thought that they'd be like at least competent against the run, and they weren't. Oh, things happen. I mean, you get a, you get, you obviously get the touchdown return, uh, in which Teddy Bridgewater made minimal effort to, uh, I I was watching that play on red zone. I was kind of like, well, see, I like, I assumed that they blew the play dead the way that it evolved because I couldn't hear the volume. Yeah. So I may be the only one who like, I, I would defend Teddy on that because a gruesome leg injury in his past, like, you know, that's pretty rough, but also we saw Baker Mayfield when he hurt his shoulder, earlier this year that was on a tackle on a pick and like the net benefit of Teddy trying to make that tackle. I feel like it might be better for him. Like not just totally mail it in like he did, but like, I understand not selling your soul to get that tackle. I don't know if it's just because like, I, again, grew up in Minnesota. I like Teddy generally, but like, I kind of get it just for him specific for him, very specifically given the past and given that, you know, Baker hurt his shoulder this year too. So maybe, I don't know. It's a bad take. But still, like two and a half points of movement the wrong direction is uh, is not good. Yeah, so someone after Philadelphia. 
we need a palate cleanser, Ed. So let's do that and turn the page towards week number 11 by talking to Nate Tice. Once again, Nate is on Twitter at Nate underscore Tice. You can find him on the Athletic Football Show uh, twice per week. He's also on the Silent Count, which is his sub stack. Uh, you can find that by going to Nate's Twitter profile at Nate underscore t- Tice and checking out the Silent Count there. We're going to talk week 11 in the NFL talk some Breeders' Cup, uh, look back at that, some horse racing, and uh, also get his thoughts on film analysis in betting on the NFL. But first, FanDuel and Simple Mobile have partnered to add an extra layer of excitement to one of the biggest free-to-play contests on the market, introducing the FanDuel Free-to-Play Gridiron Pick'em Contest presented by Simple Mobile, a completely free-to-play contest that gives you a chance to win big on Sundays. Here's how it works. Simply answer 10 pick'em questions for the week's slate of NFL games and compete for a chance to win your share of $10,000 in cash prizes. If you're one of the highest scoring users on the day, you'll be eligible to win some cold, hard cash kickoff. We'll be here before you know it. So head to FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash gridiron pick'em and make your picks today and skip the contracts with high-speed data. Talk and text on a powerful nationwide network with Simple Mobile. For more details, visit FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel Fantasy app. Eligibility restrictions apply. Covering the present. Let's bring Nate Tice into covering the spread to talk week 11 in the NFL. And Nate, we appreciate the time. You're a busy guy. How are you doing today? Busy guy. Yeah. You know, the tough life of being on Twitter and watching football. Like, yeah, really, really busy guy. That's what it felt funny when I was complaining to you guys about it. It's like, trust me, I would much rather have this complaining about lack of sleep than uh, maybe being in the grind of a football season right now. <laughs> yeah. Nate, Talk to you- us like mid-May and I think we'd take this, right? Correct. Exactly. Oh, I get vacation in July. This is yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the worst thing in the world. Nate, do you count watching football as work? Not really. That's <laughs> not really. Not it's even not... the bulk of your hours per week. I don't know. I would say I... Thursday night, Thursday night game could turn into work. Like oh, if I like right. Thursday night game, if I'm like, Hey, I'm watching this. I'm like, this does feel like work. If I'm, if it's a certain <laughs> thing, but you try to find something in it that's like entertaining. Right. whether it's a rookie or something like that. But no, it, it doesn't feel like work. It really doesn't. I mean, there's times when you're trying to put together something and you're messing something up on streamable and then like some the clip doesn't edit how you want it to. That will feel like work. But no, this is uh, I, I consider myself pretty lucky. <laughs> Video editing extraordinary at this point, I'm sure. So that, that oh can be a, go on the resume. Yes. That's always a good thing yes. for sure. I do podcast editing, video yeah. editing now. I Social media manager. I guess you could throw that out there too. <laughs> <laughs> Checking all the boxes. Exactly. Uh, and Nate, I feel bad because I think I, I missed a chance here because – in retrospect, we should have had you on a couple weeks ago to talk Breeders' Cup because you've talked about how you yes. grew up around horse racing. Your dad yes. hosts, I think, a horse racing podcast or something. He, of yeah, that he, he dabbles. Yeah, <laughs> he so dabbles like, in his retirement. I feel like we missed the boat not having you on. Did you? Were you in on the Breeders' Cup this year? I was. I, I, I this was the least I handicapped. I think for it, I was just. I was originally going to go maybe for a day because it was in LA. Uh, my parents were going to go, and I was maybe going to try and drive over for Friday or Saturday. And then I kind of, when I realized I wasn't going to go, I kind of just lost interest. So this year's Breeders Cup was not big, but I, I did okay in the Preakness and the the Derby this year, I think. And generally I do well at Belmont Park just in general, like yeah. for whatever reason, the, how the, the track breaks down, like it makes sense in my brain, like how my angles just work there. So <laughs> I always try to focus on Belmont when that happens in the summer. Right. Yeah, so we're awesome. gonna talk to you about like NFL stuff, but what's your uh, yes. what's your horse racing uh, process? Are you a numbers guy? Uh, how we uh, how we filling out bets on the horse racing side? Numbers guys, the works, of course. Um, I really like to look at class, you know, class drops and class rising, which I mean, nothing crazy, and really it's just finding the most, like just like anything. I mean, shoot, just like any gambling angle, you just try and find as, as many circles as possible. And that's that's how I do it. It's just like, hey, I like this circle. Hey, I like this right. circle. Hey, I like this circle. Oh, we had a good work. He had a bullet circle. And then it's just like, oh, I like this trainer. He's at 28% circle. And then it's like, all right, well, this guy's got five circles. This has three. Oh, this is a good price. I've I've leaned more and more as I've gotten older into just trying to find bombs, five, five to one or more, as opposed to, you know, some two to ones, three to ones. And that's actually worked a little better because then I don't bet every race. <laughs> I get some big eight races as opposed to all 12. I got to get action at all 12. So that kind of helps. Do you still like find time to like get some horse racing stuff down like during football season? Or are you too busy to like actually do like side hobbies when <laughs> things are so crazy right now? Up until after the draft is when okay. I can focus on it, which is kind of works. Uh, Derby's usually the first week in uh, May. So and that's 
it, oh my God, the first year I could have gone to the Derby, it was the year Goodell moved it two weeks back. So it was the yeah. same weekend as the draft. Oh my God. I'm like to this day, I'm still bitter. I've been to Derby twice. So I'm not complaining, <laughs> but uh, usually May there's a lull and you can start getting ready for the Preakness. It's really like Preakness is when I get into it. And then Del Mar and Saratoga opening days, like that's usually near the end of coaching vacation. My entire life schedule has been based off coaching vacations and coaching schedules. So <laughs> right. this is, that's my ebbs and flows. So yeah, so June and July is kind of my horse racing time. Okay, that's awesome. good to hear. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to yeah. get you on for a full show sometime to. to talk uh, some horse racing. I'd be I'm very down for that. Now the, re the reason I want you on outside of the horse racing stuff was because you're in this like really unique position on NFL Twitter where you understand it and consume and will utilize analytics and numbers and you get the, the point of them and you understand them, but also you're obviously grounded in film. And that's why I want to talk to you about, because we're a numbers based podcast for the most part. I want to talk to you about what the numbers miss when you're seeing people citing numbers, when utilizing stuff specifically for, for betting, what are they overlooking and what can we gain by watching film to kind of bridge that gap between the two things? Yeah. And, and, and this is fun. Like this is my favorite discussion with analytics and film. I mean, this is where we're at with sports and, I got lucky as a, at a young age, uh, obviously my dad was like, okay, you're a pretty good athlete. You might do something, but he really encouraged me just to learn every sport and learn, not just like the face value. He bought me Moneyball in 2003. I was, you know, 14, 15, like he was that Moneyball actually really, I mean, it's corny as it is nowadays, but it really did have a big effect on me, but he wanted me to learn that it was when he was the head coach. I mean, he was fairly aggressive on fourth down at the time. That's what's yeah. hilarious. It's like, it's hilarious. Like if you look back at like shotgun and fourth down numbers there, they're like, man, Bill Parcells was super aggressive on fourth down. It was like, he went for fourth down like six times on the entire year. Like, you know, and like, Oh, Peyton Manning was always in the shotgun in the two thousands. He was a shotgun, like 48%. And that was crazy yep. at, that, at that time period. But he was always encouraging me with that. So I never like was snooty about it. I, I found that there was, I think a lot of football guys, it's, it's a class. I think it's just human element. It's like, I don't understand this. Nah. Like, ah, and they, it's just really taking the time. And that's what film is too. On the, on the flip side, I I've realized, I'm not trying to like throw shade or anything is that not a lot of guys watch it. Like even though the ones that say they do <laughs> is because mm -hmm. it takes time, just like crunching numbers, just like going over anything. It just takes time and effort. And I think with film stuff is of course the human element. I mean, that's just the obvious answer. Um, but it's just a piece of the puzzle. And when, when I'll watch a film, but, uh, and I, I think I might get into this later as well. I watch film, you can see process and you can see maybe the results not there. And that's what the stat counts, right? The result, uh, most mm -hmm. of them, <laughs> um, but it's a watching the process and watching some of these teams. It's like, they're doing the right thing. They're more sound with their scheme. They're more sound with their, and I know that's a whole nother discussion of what is soundness. But they're looking, they're doing the right thing. And then it's a tip ball that went bad. It's a guy, the guy was in the right spot, but missed a block. Uh, the quarterback was about to throw a wide open touchdown. His arm got hit. Like a great example of this right. is the Cowboys Broncos game two weeks ago. If you just looked at face value, you're like, oh my God, the Cowboys sucked. You watch that game. It's like the Cowboys had three open touchdowns. And it was just like Dak's arm barely got hit on a fourth and one. Um, another one where the, oh, hit, mm -hmm. Cooper's going to run it for a touchdown on the slant, hits him right in the chest. Like, the process was good though. And I think that's where yeah. film can kind of like bridge that gap and fill it out. It's like, who's getting lucky and unlucky just on the process. But I, I've, I've really tried to explain things. I'm trying to hone in on it is like video game and RPG terms, like <laughs> multiplier effects and like some things aren't as effective as other things. Like I know the, the adage of passing ball is generally more effective, but I, I've, I've really found that running the ball and this might be a whole nother discussion. Sorry. I, I, I this, this always gets me going because I try to, I've tried to figure it out. Like right. it's, I, that's why it fascinates me is like, you know, pitch framing in baseball. Like we, at first it was like fielding and base running and pitch framing. That doesn't matter. It's all about getting on base and scoring runs and, and hitting home runs and da, da, da. then they figure out pitch framing is really freaking valuable. <laughs> it could save you a lot of runs and a lot of wins over a year. Right. That's what my theory and I have nothing behind this, but my theory is that that's what running the ball is. That it is, yes, in an EPA way, it might be less than what football is, or throwing the football is, but there's something else to it. That four-yard gain has a bigger effect than the four-yard gain of throwing the ball. Because, and I think Brandon Staley had a great point about it, about... It's just going to ask, makes, yeah. Yep, makes defense, and he, he Staley's great because he kind of puts a, he's, he's a great communicator, so that helps. Um, but he, 
put it in a great way. It makes the whole defense play defense as opposed to throwing the ball turns into a one-on-one. It, it turns, it can be, it, it, yes, you're there's progression, and everything, but it turns into a receiver versus a corner. Yes. Guys have to block da, 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 da. But really there's other guys that aren't affected when you run the ball everyone gets affected. And so it can have a multiplier effect. And then there's other things like I think center play is just as valuable as left tackle play. That's I, I can get into this because it's like these multiplier effects that these human element things, the less efficient, the less uh, every time you go to the well, just things become less efficient. It, it's that's why I think the film kind of shows that maybe sometimes as opposed to when you just go, wow, they just do an incompletion. Like not all the incompletions are built the same. So Nate, let me let me ask you this from someone who's never played football. You know that Brandon Staley uh, quote was, you know, maybe the only clip of a coach I've watched all year. I mean, this is not stuff I do, but we, you know, the whole analytics community was in this this a buzz about Staley a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that has kind of abated a little bit due to some of his fourth down decision making. <laughs> oh my god, I, I just I I heard a screams happening when that happened. I was like, "What is going on? Is that my yeah, career? No, what, what is going on?" Um, but yeah, no, he talked about the physicality of the running game, and for me, my question was like, "Well, it's it's not you're not playing two hand touch on the offensive line when you throw the ball, right?" So, what is different about running it is it is it is it just a matter of degree or help me understand that so i mean just think of yourself like as people moving forward is a lot easier than moving backwards Uh, i'm punching moving backwards the pass set is moving backwards going like this a run is moving forward like this Mm -hmm. as a and it's easier on an offensive line it's it's just easier it's it's tiring i mean that's why the highest paid guys are the highest paid guys because they could do that for a full game is pass that pass that pass that so running the ball is just it's just easier like it's just i mean just as a as a human being like it's just it, it's you bench press it, it you can bench more than you can pull i think that's a better way to put it too mm-hmm. and, and i know i'm using now using strength lift <laughs> strength uh strength uh numbers and stuff like that but that is what it is and that's we say it's a mindset, but really it's just kind of physics. Like it is just, I, as opposed to those guys dictating what they do. I, if I'm pass setting, it's more of like a mirror shuffle. Um, you mm-hmm. can pop a guy and make him slow down and everything. And then running the ball is more just like you're putting your will onto them. You're dictating what to do. I think so. I think that's, I'm, try, I'm trying to hit it in different angles. So it's, it's almost like it's a reactionary if you're pass setting and it's more like you are proactive mm-hmm. if you're running the ball. I think that's active versus reactive. Yeah. And stuff Correct. Like that. That, there yeah. you go. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's why that, that zone stuff that uh, those chain hands uh, and the Staley's of the world, they run a lot of naked uh, bootlegs and why those help the offensive line is because they don't have to do anything. They just walk down the line. The joke about that, what that's called is called elephants on parade. <laughs> like that's, that's what that's what the teaching point is. All right. All right. It's bootleg here. Elephants on a parade because they just slide down. But it's a breather for them. Mm-hmm. It's a breather. So even though they're passing the ball, they don't have to think mentally. It's also that's the other thing is, and especially the NFL, is defenses have gotten crazy complicated, especially the pressures. And the blitzes that come, are it's mentally exhausting to get it right every single time. It's a little easier. Ru- running the ball gives you a little more room for error. If I'm passing the ball, the Chargers Vikings team yesterday or on Sunday, it's a perfect example for this. The Chargers offensive line, yes, they were fine most of the time, but on all those third downs and second and longs, Herbert was having to scramble because they couldn't sort out the blitz. And but then when they run the ball, it'd be a lot easier on them. And so it's kind of like that. It, it's like a mental thing too. So it's physically tiring, mentally tiring, and that's why the guys that are really good at it make a lot of money <laughs> because there's like yeah. five guys that could do it. <laughs> that's cool, Nate. So here, all right, let me ask you this too. Um, you, we can, we can quantit, we can quantit, we, well, someone's figured out how to quantitatively track the effect of pitch framing. So how do we do it for running the ball? And so I can make all my friends mad. <laughs> I, but, I hope this sparks a, I hope this sparks something where you just like start getting into it because I would love to know. Um, I, uh, it's, that's the thing with it is because so much about running the ball is proper, like where everyone's going. Like it, it, cause right. everybody has to be on the right page. Do you watch the Cowboys offense or even the Patriots offense actually, which they've done a good job in the run game. Everyone goes to the right guy. So even if the guys that are mm-hmm. lesser players, they're at least a speed bump in the right spot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right. but that's, that's what's so hard is, is that coaching or is that the players? Cause I watched mm-hmm. the, then I watched the bears offensive line 
And you're like, okay, some of these players aren't bad. Jason Peters, you know, he, I mean, he was 39, but you watch him like two guys are going to the ro- block into the wrong guy. And so now it's a chicken and the egg thing. Uh, what I'm saying is this is really hard, Ed, to like figure out like what, <laughs> who is it? Is the player or the coach? You can kind of start seeing who makes similar mistakes like over and over and over as a play goes on or as a game goes on. But I think it, what it is is really finding free runners. It's like who lets up, and especially in pass protection, who lets up the most free runners like as far as no one's touching this guy as they come in. Sometimes that's planned if it's a certain protection, but that's that's you have to know the rules. And then running the running the ball, the same thing is, I guess it'd be like bodies close to back <laughs> in backfield, I guess, or something of that sort. Yeah. And that's I want to figure it out, too, because there is something to run the ball. And I wish I and I'm with you guys. I'm a quarterback by trade. I want to chuck the ball as much as possible. But I know I know there is something to it. And it, I've seen it just I know. And it's just that human element that I want to quantify. And just like you said, with pitch framing, it's like, oh, yeah, we figured it out. And look what happened. It's like. Hopefully someone can figure it out with zone runs and duo and power and all that stuff. (laughs) Well, I think it's interesting specifically for like a team like the Bills, because I think that that's been one of the criticisms of them is that they've gone too far potentially in throwing. And maybe that's a reason we'll talk about them later on. But is that something you could potentially point out as being a shortcoming in their offense is not getting their offensive linemen engaged enough via running the football? Do you think that that's a legit criticism of that offense have gone too far? Yeah, it was funny because everyone was getting on the Chiefs, and I was like, it's happening in Buffalo too. Like, right. no, and no one's really <laughs> talking about it. And yes, and no, it's there. I think the more the limitation came from the formations they were playing in, and they had, they were going all 11 personnel, which I, teams can do, with 11 personnel being three receivers. Any team can do that. That's fine. I'm not saying that's bad. It's more that they would detach the tight end from the formation, they would treat him like another receiver. If you watch the Chiefs, Kelsey is basically another receiver for them. Like he is not a good blocker. He's fine, but he's but he's really good at receiving. That's why you do that. (laughs) That's why you want him to do that stuff. But with defenses got smart and go, well, if he's not gonna be part of the formation, when I say detached, that means he's split out. He's not in a three-point stance or he's not near the tackle. Why that matters, there's only a certain amount of run concepts you can get to. There's only five or six Hmm. types of concepts you can get to, but you're basically taking away the options for them. So now, as opposed to rock, paper, scissors, the defense could just go, they're bringing rock every time. Mm. So we're going to go paper every time. So we, they're, you're just taking away that uncertainty of that. And that's the limitation. It's not so much, oh, we throw the ball every single time. It's just how they were doing that. They were just really leaning into these light, light formations, spread formations. And I think it just took away their options. And I think they realized, oh, shoot, we can't just keep living this way because defenses just go, okay, fine. We'll just let you <laughs> But you run zone one more time and right. we'll, we'll, four yard gain. We'll let you do that. We'll just let you do that because we're not going to let Mahomes or Josh Allen do their thing <laughs> against well, us. And it's really interesting because you see Noah Gray mm-hmm. on the field a lot Sunday night. Yes. You see Blake Bell on the field a lot Sunday night. It seems like maybe they real like oh, self scouting yeah. type thing. Yes, I was fired up. It was before I thought they would do it after the bye week, and they did it before. I think yeah. the bye week's in two weeks. And Yes. And I actually on the notes, because we, we might talk about that game was that's actually was so encouraging for me to see was not only they were using yeah Noah Gray, who actually I was high on the draft. I have a lot Noah, of dynasty shares, so I, I need oh, yeah. I needed to come through. <laughs> I know. I, I think he's going to be all right. Like I, I liked him he, and he's tougher than you realize. That's the thing. He's smaller, but he actually was like a fullback for him. But yeah, um, but they at Duke, I mean, but when but they're using Blake Bell and stuff, there was a reason you're hearing those names is because they went into more they defenses. Now it used to be base defense which is 4334 four. that was the base defense and we would see so much of it so every coach teaching their defense rules they would that's what they're teaching these are the base defense rules because we're facing base offenses fullbacks and tight ends then everyone went light and went receivers so all the defenses got fun and like all these blitzes and funky looks and dime personnel packages and now we're seeing this flip back where it's like hey we're not going to let you do any of that fancy stuff and we're just going to get to like basic tight end football and like run the ball. And it's funny how it's kind of circled back where it's like they went simple to fight the complex and how the chiefs did it, which I, yeah, I was freaking on it was they went under center a whole bunch of times, which was more to help their run game. They helped what they could get to um, because certain types of runs you telegraph if you're in the shotgun and also, yes, the tight ends and the play actions and the deeper throws. And it was kind of like they really, 
I, I'm not going to say like they listen to my podcast, but they were listening to some <laughs> of the, the, the criticisms, criticisms that were happening yeah. to them. And it was kind of funny. It was like, yeah, these are, this is exactly what I was hoping that I would see under center play action and they'd use tight ends. And that, that's what they did. Yeah. That's it's, it's pretty exciting. Too, it, it, I'd like to see the, the, not just for my Noah gray dynasty shares, but also because it's fun when the chiefs are fun. It's fun. It's yeah. fun. Exactly. Yeah. I know. I don't, I don't, I don't like when it kind of like the bottom falls out. I, yeah. I like when I like watching teams trying to sort through it and try and figure right. what figure right. out the, with their new way. Cause the, the NFL, the, the not for long joke applies yeah. to everything. It's right. so everybody adapts, players get better, coaches get better, coaches change, players change. So it's like schemes get stolen, schemes get adapted. Like, and so like your little awesome play that you're spamming for a year guess what? Everyone else saw you spam it for a year. So they're going to adjust to right. it. So I, I like watching the counter punches that happen. Right. The yeah. adjustments and, and the the smart brains at work. And I think Andy yes. Reid, obviously near the top of that yes. list, Brian Dable as Absolutely. well. We'll see what they Correct. eventually do. Now, I want to go back to something you mentioned before, Nate, how when watching film, you can better understand context, understand bad breaks, understand process and teams that are in the right spots. A lot of us may not have time to, you know, go back and watch film and get that. So have you found any ways to kind of bridge that gap to make it where, okay, I made out of time to watch these games before I bet them. Is there any sort of like, I don't know, like shortcuts, a bad word for it, but like, is there a yeah. way people can do it if they don't have the time to go back and watch each game? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very hard. I would say looking at, if you were just say maybe looking at numbers that like maybe broke down the film, I would yeah. say situation stuff is more, maybe more important than we realize. And that's, it's not so much like, Oh, this team's first. It's more like, okay, this team's really bad on third downs. Why? Okay. And then you kind of reverse engineer from there. This seems really bad in the red zone, red zone. They haven't scored a bunch. Okay. Why? And then go from there. And that's how a film study works for me is I'm going like, so-and-so just caught seven balls. Why is that happening? Okay. Da, 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 and I, and then I'll watch the offense wherever. And, but I think if you want to go like a real short version, NFL has actually done a great job on YouTube, putting just condensed games and it's like 12 to 20 minutes. It, honestly, they put in every relevant play. And I, at first I was like, Oh, it's just going to be third downs and scoring plays. They put in like a bunch of like garbage plays in there that I like, <laughs> but actually if you want to get just the vibes for a team, like those do a great job. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they really do. Like there'll be games where I actually did it this morning. Cause I, I'm not going to watch Jack's Colts on film. So I just watched the 20 minute condensed version and just did, 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 you know, fast forward all the way through it. But um, I would, yeah, it's hard. It's cause I'm talking about both sides of my mouth. It, it's like, I, it's, Oh, you have to put in the time, but it's, I think really, if you're just like kind of just getting the crib notes of film, it's finding that situation stuff. And it's God, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> cause it's the short answer is no. Yeah. Right, <laughs> but right, that, there's right. no real shortcut because right. I mean, there's been plenty, there's plenty of execs that have done that, <laughs> but sure, it's, I'm sure. yeah, but it's, right. it's hard. It's, you just got to find like the right, maybe the right Twitter account that shows some stuff or yeah, I know it, it's, I wish I had a better answer, but if I did, it would just be finding, if you find those types of plays where you're like, this guy has a lot of drops or they're bad on this situation, they're bad on this, 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 and that finding the why from there. And I think you can do that either through Twitter searches or just going on YouTube and finding like a quick little clips going like, Oh, it's cause they, that ball got tipped. Tom Brady threw the first pick because you know, the ball, it was an unlucky thing. Like then you find out and get your answer from there. That's watching film. Yeah. <laughs> and I will say not to like blow you up, but like listening to the podcast you do with Robert Mays, that's done that for me is like, it's a nice bridge not to like, again, you know, blow sunshine your butt, but like that has helped me a lot because I don't have time to do that stuff. So it's nice to have resources you can utilize and people yes. doing that work and leaning on them. So it's all that's, pieces of the puzzle. And yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like, even, even for me, and that's what I actually, I, I try to say to people, this is just my thoughts on this. Yeah. It, it's I can, we can watch me and 40 coaches, quarterback coaches can watch the same throw. And we can have like 10 different answers right? and just go like, oh, this guy's wrong. This guy's wrong. This guy's short. I think he's too deep. I think he's perfect. You know, Th and that's what it kind of sucks. But it's like, as long as you have pretty good rules and you think right. you're following some smart people, I'm not saying me, but just like, like Brandon Thorne for offensive line yeah. or something, then you can kind of like, okay, okay. I can, like you said, bridge gaps and find different pieces of the puzzle that work. Yeah. Have a process in place. It's yes. true for everything. True for watching everything. film, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> yeah. for sure. So let's talk about those Bills. They're facing the Colts this week. Seven and a half point favorites are the Bills. Total is 50 and a half. Let's talk about the Bills offense here because like the word feel is weird here, but they felt, they felt disjointed. They felt off uh, for the entire year. They've had spurts. They put up huge point totals and they've won by massive swings, but like 
it's felt odd. Have you gotten the same vibe from them? And if so, does it impact your short-term view? Long-term, they'll probably figure it out. But like short-term, where are you at in the Bills offense right now? Well, and that's the thing is I keep, I, I keep going, oh, they'll figure it out. We're in week 11. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> and that's that time's ticking, you know? And usually the bye week, not only just for health, is so important for good coaches, I would say. That's when you see the good teams make the upswings. It's because they self-scout and adjust and figure out what the counter punches for what they're doing are. So, you know, the, maybe with the bills, but I, I do think that it, it's there. It's very hodgepodge right now with this offense. It's, I do know, think they know what their weaknesses are. They're like, yeah, we can't run the balls because we're doing this stuff. But then it's so, then they, they're like, okay, they want to check this box to run the ball. So then they just go, okay, we're in I formation out of nowhere. And it's like they, their fullback plays two plays and it's just like out of nowhere. And it's just like, where did that come from? So it's kind of yeah. seems disjointed. And that's a team to me that seems like they're just they're trying to figure it out, which I I appreciate. Again, they've had some injuries like against the Dolphins, I want to say. Or no, it might be the Jacks. It was the Jacks. Um, it was uh, John uh, John Feliciano was hurt, and he actually was super important to what they do. I was with John in Oakland. He was our backup center. Is that he's actually better at the center stuff than Mitch Morse's. So it's when he's gone, all of a sudden you bring pressures against him. It's like, Oh boy, like you, you don't know where he's going to help sort it out or do anything like that. And that's kind of what happened. That's where injuries can come into effect, but it's, I trust Josh Allen. I don't think, uh, yes, he has regressed. I think he just had to, they got, they were a team of destiny last year. They really were If, if watching it. He's breaking contain. He's throwing like 40 yard daggers balls getting tipped right into Stefan Diggs' hands. And it's like, <laughs> that's, that's your year. They were a good team. Don't get me wrong. I bet more on the defense with this Bills team right now, and I think it's more the offense is very high variance. It's going to be certain teams they're going to blow out of the water because they match up well, and there's going to be certain teams that will give them fit because they're going to make them matriculate down the field. So I do think some of these struggles are real because I thought I would see more, I'll just use the term again, more counterpunch to this point but they just kind of like, this is what they are and how they kind of have now gone about it is they hodgepodge a couple new other concepts just to kind of alleviate some stress. But I think this is just what they are. I think it's going to be some teams, some weeks they throw up 40 and it's Josh Allen being professor chaos. And I think that some weeks it's just like they struggle to score seven or 10, you know, and, and it's like, whew, because running the ball does raise your bar. And right now their best run is running Josh Allen, which is right. never, never fun. No. <laughs> well, so we're talking about this Colorado. weekend. Yeah. What's this weekend going to be? What do you, how, do you, how do you see them? Do you like the matchup against the Colts? I That's the thing is I talked myself into it. Like even with the Colts, I would actually go with the Colts on this one because I just think they make the Bills' life hard. I think the Bills still win, but seven and a half is not what I was really expecting to see in this game. I thought it would be a couple points less. Um, the Colts match up actually very well. They play soft coverages. And they're going to make – they're going to make Josh Allen and the, the Bills offense play hard football and matriculate down the field. I think the flip end of that is it's really hard to bet on Carson Wentz. <laughs> <laughs> it's because when I talk about high variance, that, oh, yeah. that that's him every single play. Yeah. Is He's high variance. He could throw the greatest throw you've ever seen in your entire life, and then he could throw the next one that's just like, oh, my God, you shouldn't be on yeah. the football field. And <laughs> I think – but Colts know that. I think they're why they're getting a little healthier. They like to be in more tight end and heavy formations, which actually is good against the Bills because the Bills will run big nickel, which is five DBs uh, with or three safeties, I should say. It's kind of an advantage for the offense if if you do it if you can do it throughout an entire game. So it's one of those where I think they can make it ugly, make it like a 21-17 type game, make it just real nickel dimey on both sides of the ball. So where the clock just and I just think maybe Jonathan Taylor probably gets 27 touches. <laughs> but I think that's the Colts game plan. And I think that's what they'll do. They the Colts are the Colts, I have no idea what to make of the Colts. They're just one of those teams that just every week I watch them, I hate them and love them at the same time. So <laughs> I, I've been trying to avoid yep. betting them most parts. But like this week actually isn't terrible. It's, it's at seven and a half, too. It went past the touchdown mark. And it's like, okay, I, I, I could talk myself into that. Yeah. When I checked today, uh, FanDuel is at seven and a half. Okay. A lot of the places were at seven. So, um, uh, I'm curious what you guys think. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I mean, like, okay. I think going back to the Tennessee game, you saw some situations where if it's a physical big team, they can actually move the ball against this defense. And that's a big advantage Buffalo has right now is the defense yeah. that might be mitigated here, especially when you've got a running back who is just unconscious at all times, yeah. like Jonathan Taylor is right now. That to me would be pretty scary if I were someone trying to back the Bills at seven and a half. Yes. And, that, and, that, and I think it's going to be a shortened game too it's like you know i i that's 
I I could see how this guy game kind of goes. And if it's Josh Allen might have one of those games where he goes, you know, like 32 or 38, because it's just, they're, they're going to make him nickel dime, but that's the thing. That's basically like run the ball. So it's good. Yeah. That clock's going to be going. And so I think it's gonna be a very shortened game. Interesting. Yeah. My numbers hate the Colts. They like, <laughs> they like Buffalo by nine. I, um, <laughs> so um I, I, I'll put I this I'm staying say, away from this game, so I'll put it yeah. that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just gonna throw in there. Like we know, we know how volatile Carson Wentz is. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people saw the disaster that he was against Tennessee, yes. but he actually only has three picks on the year, which are the, yes. you know, and two of them came very late in that Tennessee game. I don't think that's sustainable, but um, you know, the results haven't been terrible for that offense in terms of the turnover department. Uh, Again, like I said, I don't think it's sustainable. Wonder what you think, Nate? Yeah, I mean that's the thing is he's he's I don't either. <laughs> it's that he <laughs> he puts the ball in harm's way a lot, and it's I think it's a couple have gone his way so far. And it's one of those. I mean he he's just so frustrating, man, because he'll just throw some <laughs> awesome throw, and you're just yeah. like, oh, he's got it, he's got it figured out. He's right. comfortable and he's confident, and then the mm-hmm. next two plays will be him twirling around in the end zone and flinging the ball up and it's like you have like a hundred starts like what are you doing right. <laughs> like <laughs> like so i think it's yeah not it's not a rookie. yeah he's not and <laughs> even when he was a rookie he was an old rookie it's like yeah. so i i think it's i think you're exactly right and that's why it's it's a hard game for me i've talked myself even when i was prepping for this i went back and forth on this like five times because right. i was just like man and that usually when I do that, that means I'm not betting. Stay away. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's the smart play for sure. So yeah. Let's move to Packers and Vikings. Packers two and a half point favorites here. Total is 49. And when I was asking about like, you know, film versus numbers, I kind of was talking about the Vikings because the Vikings every freaking week, my numbers say, Hey, bet the Vikings. And like, they've been fine against the spread. Like they've covered some big numbers uh, at times and they've played well and had close losses, but like, I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall. Uh, my numbers specifically love the passing offense, and the passing defense. So when you watch them, do you think that's legit or what's going on here? I do. I, uh, as, as an eye test guy, I have been bet- big on the Vikings as well this entire year. And it's been very frustrating when they <laughs> just lose all these squeakers and have these yep. tip falls and bad penalties and Dalvin cook fumbles when they're driving against the Bengals. Like, you know, yeah, I I one of my angles has been on the Vikings because I thought they've been undervalued from a national sense. I think a lot of people are just like, oh, same old Vikings. And it's like, ah, this team's actually pretty good. <laughs> like, I think they're actually a good team. And I've been super high on them the whole year, uh, even with Kirk Cousins and Mike Zimmer, like trying to punch each other every game. Um, I think the offense, and uh, that's a good question about their passing offense. I think Cousins is playing well. I think more of it, too, it helps to have very good players like Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. And KJ Osborne's played well for him as well. And Conklin, uh, the tight end. So I think it's that they have learned to adapt to more of three wide receiver 11 personnel. They're not being so heavy in eye formation and all that. And so they can actually drop back and pass when they need to and be operate from the shotgun a little more. And I think that's kind of ha- helped them just – add another element to their offense and not be so like, Oh my God, we have a bad game script. We're down 10. We're done. Like, cause we have to run eye formation runs for the next three quarters. I think it's just now they've built themselves another way to attack defenses and they do a good job, but they get in the red zone. They're really fun. Like they, I mean, Justin Jefferson's a hell of a player. I mean, he's honestly like top five receiver already. <laughs> like he, he, the stuff he does is incredible. And Adam Thielen's a good player too. So I think that's more what it is. They give a lot of teams issues. And I think defensively, they're they're all built. This is how Zimmer defenses are built. They aren't very sexy on first and second down. They kind of just do their thing. And then on third down or second along, they bring a lot of crap. And they just <laughs> bring stuff. And it's crazy. Watching the Chargers on Sunday, it was they gave them issues where the Chargers just gave up as far as trying to I, – I was talking about being mentally – this is a great example, um, how it could be mentally tiring for an offensive line to sort out protections and everything. The Chargers were – done with it they're like oh my god our guys keep getting got our running back is like blocking into our left guard knocking them off so they just did a full slide in the second half which is just that's a uh the easy button it works like <laughs> teams team, you can do it every once in a while but defenses are really good and they'll adjust to that is but what it is is you're just kind of like going like whoo, taking a deep breath i was saying yeah. elephants on parade this is more like an aggressive version of that but that's what the chargers did they just gave up they're just like we're not sorting this out anymore we're just we're just gonna wad it up and i don't care and but that's what that's what that Zimmer defense can do. They just get the third down. They can just 
make offenses just look like fools if they don't know, if they're not smart and know how to sort it out. The thing is, the Packers have this guy named Aaron Rodgers who uh, <laughs> <laughs> who actually is pretty good at sorting that out, even if his, his center situation hasn't – that's – okay, long story short, I'm betting the Vikings on this game, is – but is – that's one of the reasons was I was like, oh, Aaron Rodgers is pretty good sorting that out. But I'm like, actually, the Packers Alliance had some issues against blitzes this year. And, you know, and that's that's an angle like that. That's those are that's something that could be exploited, especially if they limit him on first and second down, which might be tough because AJ, AJ Dillon is a good back. It's that. But that's the angle that you're going for this. They get off the field on third down. They control the ball on offense and they. Yeah, and they just like keep within this game. I've been the Vikings. It's at home. It's at Minnesota and their dogs like. It's kind of an easy angle for me <laughs> to go. You don't have to twist my arm much. Yeah, I mean, my numbers have them favored. So, like, I it's pretty easy for me to get on the Vikings. Yeah. It, again, every time. Like When I saw minus two and a half, I swear, I swear. I was like, this isn't a Lambo, is it? I was like, why would the right. Vikings be favored by half a point? You know, and that was right. just because of neutral field. And I was like, oh, right. okay, never. Oh, Vikings are home dogs? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> empty my pockets <laughs> but like every week i run my numbers and i just like throw my hands up so i'm like okay i guess we're going to the vikings again yeah. this week is no different so yep. uh we'll see if uh if old kirk can keep that up let's it move now a, to it become a running joke on our friday shows with shield capati right <laughs> i kept betting the vikings for like five weeks in a row it actually worked yeah. out okay for me though like oh yeah I mean, like they, you said against the spread they've been solid like it's been yeah. good yeah. yeah they just if you keep losing close and you keep being an underdog everyone kept going oh out. so you're a vikings fan still i'm like i am not i'm no. not this is, i just like this <laughs> team i don't know <laughs> they're a weird team that's that's yeah, for sure that's always. the way i'd phrase it for sure always. let's move now to the marquee game on sunday the cowboys at the chiefs chiefs two and a half point favorites here total is 56 and we talked about this a bit last or earlier we talked about how the chiefs offense made some changes do you think the changes they made in that raiders game are sustainable do you think that can translate to future games or do you think that they're still working to figure out and, and claw their way out of this lull I think there. I think this that first tweak, the under center stuff and all that, that was good to see. I think we get the big leap from them after their bye week, which I, I still think is next week. <laughs> I, I might be wrong there, but I do think it's week twelve. Um, so I think that's where you'll see the big upswing with the Chiefs. So that's this game has been. I again, it might be a stay away from me, but it's like I, I am. I am leading more Cowboys here. Uh, if I were to gun to head, if I were to pick one, I think what the Chiefs stuff is. I think offensively they're going to figure out. I actually didn't, wasn't even that down on them early in the season. I, I stood on a pedestal and was just like, are you guys kidding me? Like, are you kidding? Like Patrick Mahomes is still Patrick Mahomes. They're just really unlucky. Like they were, they stole a, an amulet or something and they just got bad luck. Like that. I was convinced that that's what happened. And, and, and but the defense though, defense is going to be just, it, it, I Spags is a very game plan coach. Spags being their defense coordinator. Um, Steve Spagnola is, that's why they always excel as the season goes along and then not excel, but improve. And then as the playoffs go along, all of a sudden you're like, wow, they actually played pretty well. That chief's defense is because he's very good at maybe that game to game game plan. And I think in the beginning of the years, he's they're figuring out who works for them because they don't really give him a ton of talent. <laughs> so I think he's just like, which undrafted free agent do I like this <laughs> week? You know? And I think that's kind of what happens. And now usually he improves throughout the year. Cause he goes, okay, this is what we do. And then we're going to go from here. But having said that, going against a Cowboys team that can expose their run defense for four quarters and they are fine doing it. They Kellen Moore and Dak Prescott don't get worried about the past success. They come, but they are fine running the ball and they will do it. And I think that's what this game is going to turn into is Cowboy like Zeke and Tony Pollard are going to have like 18 carries each, <laughs> like not really, but like 12, 12 touches right. each, you know, but it's like, it's one of those things where they match up well. They can get into base personnel, and I brought that up again. Is with a base when you get into base offense, which is two tight ends or a fullback and a tight end, is the defense is usually matched with base personnel and defense, and they can't get into funky stuff. Spags loves being in funky stuff. So if you make him basic and you run our strength, which is the Cowboys' run game, it's like Van Dak. But run that run game, it's kind of like a night. You see kind of an answer coming to light, <laughs> you yeah. know, like kind of uh, where I would go in this game. And also that pressure stuff, even if you get into – I know you asked me about the Chiefs offense, but this it's the other side I'm really excited to talk yeah. about. Um, is that Dak in the Cowboys – Dak, really. But the Cowboys O-line is fantastic against uh, pressures. And they're good, really, really good at sorting it out. That's actually what turned me into a Dak Prescott fan a couple of years ago. So that's – why it's like kind of those advantages the Chiefs defense can bring at times they don't have in this game. 
which is usually their their ace in the hole. And I think on the flip side, it's more like I think the Chiefs offense, the Cowboys defense loves being a man, which is not what you want how you want to play the Chiefs. <laughs> and but Dan Quinn's done a good job of tweaking on uh, some games. So I'm curious how he does it too. Like that's I know, does he play soft coverages? Does he do all that? Or is he gonna just play what he plays? So I, I'm curious how that'll break out. It might be a live bet like yeah. as the game breaks on once I kind of see what what teams are doing. Uh, but I, I think this Chiefs offense is still legitimately top. I mean, I think they're a top three offense. I really do. Um, I, I just think that their big upswing is still a couple weeks away. Well, I think the the Cowboys thing is interesting because like they can beat you multiple ways, which is why I've been high on them like from a futures betting perspective. Yes. Because when you're talking about like individual matchups, it's hard to find the, a bad a bad match for them Correct. defensively. So like. Looking at Cowboys ten to one to win it all, it's a little tempting. I'll say, I I bet that yesterday. It's oh, okay. you say that. <laughs> I didn't get ten to one. I got nine to one or hey, plus eight fifty. I think I got okay. Uh, but yeah, I I agree. I think this Cowboys team has been the most impressive for me week in week out. Even the blow against the Broncos, I wasn't as down on as other people watching that game. Uh, like uh, this offense is ridiculous. I, it's my it's my favorite offense in the league just because, well, I'm a little biased because it looks a lot like my dad's old teams because <laughs> not just saying, oh, it's so good, but I'm saying because more of uh, how they run things, like how it's called and how it looks. It's because Scott uh, Linehan or Kellen Moore was a Scott Linehan guy. And on top of that, Scott Linehan was my dad's offense coordinator. So it's, and they use the same terminology. So for me, when they do protection stuff, for me, it's just like, oh, I know what they're doing. I'm like, it's, which is great. <laughs> Um, but I think this team, like the, the tight ends are so good The And now they got Gallup back Their Wilson wasn't even playing bag. their fourth receiver. Like they got Noah Brown, their fifth receiver. Who's useful. Like they have two legitimate, legitimate running backs. Like both Zeke. I was down. I thought Zeke was going to fall off the cliff of the earth or face of the earth this year. He looks good, like legitimately good. So I, 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 I'll eat crow on that. Um, he didn't, he didn't spend the off season in Cabo and he actually worked out. <laughs> so that, that helps a little bit. And then this defense. They've just gotten performances out of players that, and that's what you need. Which you need to be a surprising unit. You need guys to step up. But not only with Parsons, but uh, Osa. Uh, if you've heard the show, you've heard me butcher his name every single week. Osa Ozabawe from UCLA. Their D tackle is like a legitimately good player as a rookie. Um, of course, Trayvon Diggs, and then their D, but their DBs just do enough where I'm like, okay, they can sustain against a good offensive unit. So it's like. I really like this team. I really do. It's not just star power, but it's just like the stars are playing like real efficient, smart football. That's that's Nate, a good team. Nate, can I ask you about Diggs? Because he's interesting. He's got a lot of interceptions, but it's given up some big plays to yeah. what, what's kind of going on there. Is that usual for him? Is that something that Dan Quinn is doing? How it's do a I little understand? bit. Yeah, it's a little bit of what they do because uh, – they'll pass stuff off and like I guess the Patriots he let one up and everyone was kind of dogging him it wasn't his job to do it like he was supposed to let the guy go inside and the safety was supposed to help him out the safety went rogue so that can be frustrating when you watch it yeah. and um I think D Diggs is kind of what you think he is he he is a home run hitter like he strike out he's swings and misses and or he's hitting it over the fence and but I do think he is around the ball but there's not a mis to make those plays you have to be around the ball like you mm -hmm. can only get so lucky with tip tip balls coming to you which he right, did right. that's why the numbers are crazy but i think a lot of that is because he is around it i think he is a true long man corner i wouldn't say he is i think he's second defensive player to year voting right now which i would i wish i could fade it like yeah. <laughs> you know because it is he has he's a good right. player but he's gotten lucky where the stats are incredible right now so i think that's a better way to put it. just like everything in life it's somewhere in between but he has improved. I still, I would say he's a good corner, but I'm not saying he's a top four or five corner like some people are anointing him right now. Uh, but he can give a lot of good receivers issues. Uh, but Tyreek Hill is not a great matchup for him. Uh, that's actually kind of – he's a better guy that would go against a, a – like a DeAndre Hopkins. Um, that's a great matchup for him. The Rams guys are a pretty good matchups for him. Like I think he would hold his own against Cup. Uh, but it's like – Diggs or uh, uh, Hill is actually not the greatest, but he'd be good. Uh, he'd be good against like a Kelsey. So like bigger body receivers that he can use his length on like those types of guys is what he's good against. So I think speed gives him issues. And I just think sometimes he's, he's boom or bust. Like Richard Sherman was very safe in that kind of system. Like he was so smart and he would just put himself in plays. Mm -hmm. Diggs is kind of like the opposite. He's like a little, he's not as high IQ. Not many corners will ever be as smart as Richard Sherman is. <laughs> Yep. but he's way more athletic. <laughs> so right. that, that helps compensate for it. Yeah. That's fascinating.
Uh, <laughs> Nate, are there any other games on the board that interest you this week? Uh, yeah, I uh, Saints plus one and a half at the Eagles. My my other betting angle this <laughs> this year is uh, yeah, I Trevor Simeon. Tell I me. know, I know, I know. I'm betting on Trevor Simeon. I know. I can't believe this is what I'm doing. It's <laughs> this Eagles team. I can't figure out. So this might be okay. The last good. Time I, this, me neither. This, this game, this might be the last time I do this, but for a while I was betting against the Eagles every week. It was pretty fun. Nate, um, I've been I've been against them the last two weeks and watched the market go against me oh, drastically. Oh. I'm one and one. Uh, oh. I think I'm staying away from them this week, but but please continue. Please keep talking. <laughs> I'm glad this is what's so funny is everyone I talk to, like there's other guys that are again where they I have no idea what to make of the Eagles. So I'm like, okay, good. I'm not the only idiot. Like yeah, I'm no, not listen, the... someone out there is betting a lot of money late in the week. On that, the that's right, with two and a half points last week uh, for the Denver. It did, didn't it? Yeah. It made yeah. a point and a half the week before. Yeah. Oh, man. So the East Coast betters, man. There's someone in, <laughs> someone in Jersey, someone in Jersey must love them. You know, it's, well, it's actually probably someone in China that loves them, but uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. But the, the, yeah, but the, with the Saints, like, I, why I like the Saints is first off, defensively, I think that they aren't going to fall into what this Eagles trap is. And Eagles are been what the Eagles have done is ever since the Lions game, they realized, Hey, our running game is not that bad. We should do it. <laughs> and right. that's helped them. I think this, the Broncos defense last week was a terrible matchup for them, for, for the Broncos um, in the sense that I, this is one of those where in the moment when I first thought I thought this, and then I like didn't bet it, but then afterwards it's like, why didn't I bet this? Because actually right. that would have been the, that would have been the angle. But of course that's gambling, right? Right. Uh, but that's uh, but with the with, with this Eagles, uh, this Eagles offense, it's a little more, I wouldn't say collegey, but uh, they'll it's RPO heavy. It's very bubbles all that side to side, and then go balls down down the field. This Saints defense is fine with that. They they're rugged up front, like they can actually hold their own against this Eagles offensive line, who are a very good offensive line. So I think they, the Eagles lose that advantage up front. I wouldn't say lose it, but it's more of a neutral fight, I think. And then as far as passing the ball, and actually the uh, um, Saints linebackers have actually been playing really well as well. And then I think it's passing the ball. I think Hurts is a one-and-done read guy, which is fine because he's so mm -hmm. athletic and can make plays. But the Saints have team speed. I, I think teams that don't have team speed, Broncos are okay. But I would say the Saints are actually have guys that can run with this, that they can make these tackles and actually keep him, keep him. So it's not third and twelve, and he gets that fourteen yard scramble, and it's just a dagger into the defense. It's like more like he gets those five yards and gets tackled, and they have to punt. I think it's just that's where I think the Saints match up better against that. On the flip side, yes, Trevor Simeon. The thing about Trevor Simeon is he is the ball is always going to go to the right spot. So it's <laughs> it's and I don't think in a, this Eagles defense who has. I think they're back in other than Slay, their back end's not great. Their linebackers aren't great. They run safe coverages a lot. I think Sean Payton's like, hell yeah. Like, cause they are just gonna pound away on it. Trevor Simmons is gonna hit, hit a couple play actions. If you're running the same coverage every snap against Sean Payton, it's a hard way to live. So I'm bet it's mostly a Sean Payton versus the Eagles defense as more than a Trevor Simeon versus right. the Eagles defense. That's what I'm betting on for them. Well, is we Devonta Smith as good as he seemed to me the last two weeks he's he's incredible uh, i i had him as my receiver one going in uh, as a rookie mm -hmm. or, or in the draft i i he's incredible after week one with the falcons he he just a little things he does too like not even just like dunking on sertan but he's like a great blocker and like his route running is like really really good like it's he's he's already like one of my favorite players to watch in the league just period just because he's such a fun football player so yes yes he is as good as you maybe have seen in the last couple of weeks yeah well i mean i i, I don't consider myself i mean i watch football but i'm certainly not a film guy by any sense but from watching my well now i guess i've been one on one going against the eagles the last two weeks but from watching those two games he he looks like he's getting separation from whoever whoever and, and yeah and he plays big and that's the thing with him. It was that he was the outlier. Everyone's like, oh, his size, his size, his size. But again, this is where the, fi the film watching kind of fills it in is that how he catch the ball, he would extend, he would, and you could see it when he jumped on Sertan. He's, he, he's, his hands are so good. I give him a rare label, which I've never given, given any player that in the sc scouting adage, usually excellent is the top for where you go. You go like good, very good, excellent. And then rare is like, yeah, it's a once in a lifetime trait. You give that to it. I've never seen it for, I've never done it for anybody. And I gave it to him for his hands because that's how comfortable he is catching the ball. Even he had a couple of drops in preseason, but I was never worried. It was because he, he extends for the ball. And so 
everything becomes more available when he catches after the ball. Like if he catches a slant, because he's so comfortable catching away from his body, he can run afterwards. If it's a jump ball situation, he can go high point it. If it's a contested catch situation where it's really tight, he can extend his arms and make himself bigger. And so that was one of the things I really liked about him. And also that he played bigger, like he was 170, but he played like he's 210. And just like he blocks guys that are like 30 pounds heavier than him and like actually like moves them. And it's like, what are you? Like, why are you built like this? Like, he doesn't. It's he's the weird. He's the weirdest player to watch. But I, yeah. I love him, and he, he. Yeah, I think he's going to be a star, star. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm glad. I'm glad other people are kind of going like, yeah, he's, he's yeah, fun. He's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he won the Heisman. Yeah. He won the Heisman. Right, I'm right. acting like he's some unheralded guy. Like, no, no, yeah. no, exactly. But no, but you know, there's plenty of people that won the Heisman and not oh, being yeah. able to do anything in the NFL. Yeah, and I think it's nice that he won the Heisman because we can see just how small he is in those Nissan Heisman commercials. Right. Yes. Like how tiny he is compared to everyone else. Yeah. Yes. I know. I know. I know. He's. Oh, I know. It's just. It's it's fascinating, isn't it? Like it's just fascinating. Like wiry strong was yeah. that definition was for him. Like because it, it, especially when he's in pants and the football pants, and you see how right. skinny his legs are. Right. And you're like, God, you have the longest calves I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> well, the good thing with the fading the eagle strategy is you get to hedge because if they do well, it's probably because of him. And Correct. if they don't do well, you win money. So like, Correct. you know, you're, you're good either way. We somehow Absolutely. managed to check the Noah Gray box, the Trevor Simeon box, the early 2000s Vikings box, all in the yep. same show. So yep. I'm, I, I'm having a good day today. That is Ro- Nate Tice. Robert would be so happy right now. He'd be so right. proud of us. We just got to bring up like, uh, we got to bring up like Marshall Yonda for him. And there we go. Like, yeah, there, there we go. go. Yeah. Wyatt Teller, you know, let's, let's, yeah, Wyatt let's pull Teller. them all out. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that is Nate Tice. Check him out on Twitter at Nate underscore Tice and check out the Athletic Football Show and the Silent Count Substack as well. Nate, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much and good luck with your bets week number 11. Awesome. You guys too. Thank you so much. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Nate Tice for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on week 11 of the NFL. And Ed, I said this during the show, but like again, if you're someone like me who is numbers based, who doesn't have time to watch a lot of film. I, I would actually advocate for listening to the athletic football show because it, it has helped me a lot because it gives me like, I would say red flags in terms of like, okay, knowing to identify spots where teams may stumble, knowing where, you know, some bad matchups may lie based on what the film says. So I know like, I don't want to seem like I'm just trying to like butter up one of our guests, but like it actually has helped me in that regard in identifying weak spots. Cause I know as a better, that's one of my weak, my weak points is knowing stuff like that. And I think that identifying weak spots, knowing how to counteract them is, is a key in betting. Right. I mean, I think there is uh, a value in kind of a, a variety of knowledge, a diversity in knowledge. I mean, they talked about that when he said his dad got a money ball. And so he, he growing up as a player had a diversity of knowledge in terms of, you know, playing the game of football. And then, you know, one of, one of, one of the better books that I've read recently is, uh, is range. Uh, by David Epstein talks about a variety of knowledge, how that's uh, how that's really useful and a diversity of skills. And this actually leads to innovation. And I, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Right. Like I'm completely building team based models for the NFL. And I know my models are pretty good because I track the air metrics on every game. But that by no means means that's the end all be all for betting on football and you know, a lot of the things that Nate was talking about are things that Rob Pozzola has talked about in how he tries to evaluate things. Rob's perspective is obviously a little different. He never played, but he's trying to get some of these coaching and scheme ideas into his analysis, actually trying to quantify that a little bit. I think Nate's talking about a lot of the same things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you really do need to know as much as possible. I think, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like an ensemble approach, right? Yeah. I'm trying to get enough many different perspectives you know trusted perspectives as possible uh i don't actually listen to everyone on twitter no. when it comes to uh, betting <laughs> no, no, no. games but uh yeah curate the best and uh try to get some insights yeah there are a lot of people on twitter i'm not gonna listen to so i would agree with that for sure we do need to enlist someone for the big data bowl to figure out this uh rushing thing because i think what he's like i mean i just played in high school but like as an offensive lineman you do get kind of bored pass blocking so like i don't like again i don't know how to quantify that but i'd like someone to do so because you do get kind of bored uh and it is tiring so i get what he's saying <laughs> I'd like someone to find a way to quantify that just uh because i find it a fascinating subject i just i just want to make ben baldwin mad at me <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, the good thing yeah, is he would he wouldn't nah, have changed the the URL on the website because R R B S D M is the same if it's do or don't. So like the the URL is the same regardless. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is is you know when running backs make when running backs matter in the passing game that yeah that's an entirely different story, right? right. So DeAndre Swift was getting two yards per route run for the Lions. That that matters. Cordero um, Patterson is like second in the league in yards per route run behind Debo Samuel. How much? How much? What? What? What's his number at? Uh, he was at like two point eight or so, uh, no, no. What was it? I tweeted it out. I don't know. Okay. He was second behind Debo yeah. entering, I think, last week. Yeah, I could try to find it, but like and Alvin Kamara as a threat out of the backfield in the passing game. Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, yeah. These, these things, these things, because passing matters. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, so okay, here it is. Uh, he was entering. Two weeks ago, actually, Patterson at three point four yards per route run what? as a kind of <laughs> running back. Like, I think more than anything, we should study Cordero Patterson and the way he's being used because, like, that's the way yeah, running maybe. backs should be used. Like, find a dude right. who can do that and just lean into that. Yep. So let's move now into our covering the future for this show. We'll have college football on tomorrow. We're gonna have that. Uh, we're gonna uh, cover that tomorrow. Flip flop for today. Uh, what do you got on the NFL side of things for this weekend? Yeah, you know, I'm 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 actually on Buffalo this week. Uh, I think Buffalo is a primary Super Bowl contender, and you know, Josh Allen in the pass offense ranks ninth in my adjusted success rate. Not quite as good as they were last year, but I think they are. I, I think they're a very good unit. Um, I really like what Brian Dable has done with uh, with his play calling, with uh, just simple stuff like throwing more on early downs and only running into light boxes and so on and so forth. But honestly, Buffalo is, is a primary Super Bowl contender for me because of the defense. Um, they've been the best in the NFL in my adjusted passing success rate. Their corners have played excellent this year, according to PFF grades. And defense is clearly, uh, not clearly, defense is more volatile than offense. And so, you know, that might not hold them up all year. But when you look at both sides of the ball, uh, I think this is a really good team. Uh, I'm really looking for places to bet them and, you know, really hasn't, it, I haven't the last couple of weeks just because those spreads were so big I and mean, you can see the the credit that the markets are giving to this team. Um, but I do think this is the right spot because my metrics hate Indianapolis. Uh, Car Carson Wentz in the pass offense is 29th. My adjusted success rate. I think it's interesting that second year uh, wide receiver, Michael Pittman Jr. has been, been a re revelation uh, 2.03 yards per route an excellent rate, usually near the top for wide receivers in the NFL. But for me, the offense has really been relying on big runs from, from Jonathan Taylor. Uh, 5.8 yards per carry is, is simply unsustainable in the long run, no matter how talented he is. Uh, defensive coordinators are going to figure that out. And, uh, you know, they're, the Colts aren't much better on, on, on defense. They're 28th when I look at adjusted passing success rate. I think part of this might be the defense that they try to play. I think Nate was talking about how they, they play back and uh, they're maybe willing to give you short gains for not, for not uh, giving up big plays. They're actually not much better. When I look at adjusted yards per pass attempt, they're still bottom five. So I think this is a good spot. I like Buffalo in this situation. My numbers like them by nine and a half, nine, nine and a half, 9.3. Yeah. If you only look at data from the current season, uh, it likes Buffalo by more than 13 points. Whew. <laughs> I mean, that's that. I mean, when you when your primary uh, component in your model is passing success rate, like that's really right. going to downgrade the Colts. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's yeah. weird because success rate should be the one where Wentz grades out better because it's the implosions that, like, the massive negatives that I think about at least. Like in my head, I think about the massive implosions. I don't think about like incremental gains. I don't think about like I think about the down down being fine, but then having these Jameis moments where he just blows up, like has a right. blackout. And you know, as we mentioned, that that really hasn't hurt them except right. for the Tennessee game. Right. Uh, three picks total. I think even if you just looked at his raw pick rate, you would say that's unsustainable. But we know it's Carson Wentz. We know when a quarterback like Matthew Stafford has a bad half, we say, oh, he went full Carson Wentz. <laughs> There's a reason we say things like this. Right, right. Uh, so um, anyway, I like Buffalo. 
it's weird because this is a game where it's two teams that my numbers have been trying to fade all year. So I'm just going to stay away and be very happy about that. I've got it by uh, Buffalo by 6.3, but I'm just not going to bet it. Like I don't have a read on great read on either of these teams. So I'll stay away. Ed is on uh, Buffalo minus seven and a half. I'm going to talk about a game we talked about with Nate, and I'm actually on the same side as him because I'm still good with the Chiefs. I think that uh, they just had a bad stretch. I think that they're a very interesting team, but I'm actually even higher on the Cowboys. The reason I asked him about the Cowboys Super Bowl odds is because they're actually number one in my power rankings right now, and I don't know how to feel about that, but I'm not really opposed to it. So I'm going to take Dallas plus two and a half against Kansas City for this week. Dallas, again, leads my power rankings right now when I combine priors with 2021 data they are also first if you ignore the priors and go just based on 2021 which makes sense because my numbers like them coming into the year as well my numbers heavily weight towards passing offense you know as yours do as well the cowboys rank first there this year by number fires metrics they're also second in overall offense the efficiency the the rushing offense been very good as well the chiefs still grayed out well uh their sixth passing when you adjust for schedule they are fourth in overall offense their defense has definitely been better since Chris Jones returned. I just can't quite make them a two and a half point favorite. My numbers think the Cowboys should be favored here. This is the sixth time this year. My numbers have shown at least two points of value on Dallas. They have played. Uh, this will be their 10th game. And it's been the sixth time that my numbers have said to bet the Cowboys. And they've covered each of the previous five. They were dogs twice. They won one of those games outright. So This has been a full season thing where my numbers have been higher on the market than the Cowboys, and I've seen nothing to push back on what they're saying. So I will take Dallas plus two and a half here and see how things move during the week. And this is not an anti Kansas City thing. This is not like, oh, they're broken, blah, blah, blah. It's more so I just think the Cowboys are really freaking good. So I'm going to bet the Cowboys plus two and a half. Ed, what are your numbers saying here about Cowboys versus Chiefs? My numbers have liked the Chiefs against the markets all season. They, They like the Chiefs here by four. Um, I think partially is, you know, the chiefs are still first when, when you look at uh passing success rate after I make my schedule adjustments, they're uh, a little bit worse in yards per pass attempt, which is also a component in my model. You can kind of see that in that, you know, they're taking what defenses give them, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit less so against Las Vegas this past weekend, but, uh, I don't know. I've been, I've been hit or miss on, on betting Kansas city <laughs> based. I haven't decided whether I'm going to do it this week. Yeah. My numbers have not been super high on them, I guess, but um, it's not, again, it's not the turnover thing. I think just people, the market tends to respect them a lot, and that might be part of the reasoning why. But uh, Cowboys plus two and a half, and the Cowboys 10 to one to win it all? Pretty tempting for me for this week. That is all that we have here for today on the NFL version of Covering the Spread. As mentioned, though, we are back once again tomorrow to break down college football week number 12. You can get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave a rating and review as well, because that does help us out a bunch. Big thank you to our guest for today, Nate Tice. Find him on Twitter at Nate underscore Tice and check him out on the Athletic Football Show and on the Silent Count Substack. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I'm writing my free email newsletter. Uh, get all uh, write-ups on games that I bet, Seven Nuggets Saturday. You can check that out at thepowerrank.com. And then I had Neil Greenberg of the Washington Post on the Football Analytics Show this week. It was a fun conversation. Uh, you can check that out at uh, the Football Analytics Show is my podcast. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets this week. And we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to get some college bets down for week 12. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.